Well, good morning, church. Y'all doing all right? Are y'all awake? Listen, I've done this three times now, all right? So you better be awake because you know, I'm, I'm coming after you. No, just kidding. But I hope that you're doing good. Uh, man, uh, I know like fighting the rain off and on um, today. So thank you so much for being here. Um, if this is your first time, uh, my name is Dustin. I'm a teaching pastor. Would love to connect with you and treat you to coffee or lunch sometime um, in the near future. So uh, make sure we connect. But um, we are in week six. 17, 16, 16 of our Scent series, and we're walking through Acts. We're going to be in Acts chapter 20 today, and um, a week from tomorrow, so next Monday, uh, Sloan and I, my wife, we have the privilege of going to Israel for 10 days. So uh, we get a chance to, to leave, and um, it's, it's kind of crazy. I don't even know what to expect. Um, I know everybody who has been before has said it's so awesome. It'll just change your whole perspective of the Bible. You're going to be walking where Jesus walked and all those things. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, people ask, like, hey, what are you going to look forward to the most? And I don't really know what to say. I, um, part, part of it, I'm looking forward to the Dead Sea. I think it's going to be cool to like lay there and float. I mean, I'm kind of a bobber anyways when it comes to the water. But um, I'm looking forward to that. Sloan's like, I'm not getting in that. Um, so I don't know. It's going to be interesting. But um, we are leaving our kids um, for 10 days. And so it's like the longest we've ever left our kids. So there's a part of me that's like, man, I'm really going to miss them. There's another part of me that's like, yes, <laughs> you know, uh, we're going away without you suckers, okay? So um, y'all have to fend for yourself. But, um, but thinking about that, I know this is going to sound very mature of myself. I feel like an old man by saying this, but because we're leaving them for so long, Sloan and I decided it's a good idea if we had like a will, like just in case anything happens um, that we have a will. And, and so we kind of put all these details together and um, all that kind of stuff. And it, it got me thinking, and this is going to sound morbid, you might think I'm just weird, but I kind of want to, like, in this, there's, like, like the, this template thing I was kind of filling out and whatever that. It's asking if I had requests for my funeral. And um, I, I don't mean any offense by saying this, but as a pastor, I've been to plenty of funerals. And there have been some funerals that I've been to that are just boring. They're just sad. And I just don't want my funeral to be like that, you know? And so, like, I want my, my, my funeral to be a celebration. I want it to be exciting. Sure. Do I want my kids to be like, oh, we're going to miss dad and my wife, you know, if that happens or whatever? Sure. I, I want that to be the case. But I don't want it to be like, oh, what in the world? This is, this is boring, you know? Like, I don't want anybody to walk away from my funeral and say, well, that was a waste of time, <laughs> you know. Um, I want it to be something that has meaning and really points to Jesus. And, and so I, I kind of want to pick like what songs are being sung and who's speaking and all those things. But even with that, I, I cannot pick or control what people say about me at my funeral. I mean, can you imagine how weird that is? Like if I was to like leave uh, in my will, okay, Sloan, um, if I die, here's what I want you to say about me. He was the best husband in the world. He did, you know, made me feel so special. All, I mean, that's like pretty selfish, right? You can't do that. But what I can control and what you can control is that when one day when we do die, that we can control the way we live our life right now. That in hopes that the people that talk at our funeral will say great things about us. And when I say great things, I don't mean shallow things like, oh, he was so funny. Or, you know, he really loved his family well. I'm talking about eternal things. That I really hope that if you consider yourself a follower of Christ and as a Christian, that the whole purpose of our life is to point people to Jesus. Not to be the funny guy or to love your family well, which those are awesome things. And if people say them, that's great. But at the end of the day, I hope that you want people to talk about who you are in Jesus and how you impacted their walk with Christ. And, you know, I think about this uh, all the time. I'm, I'm probably I'm, I'm somewhat of a morbid person when it comes to that. I just, I want people to see Jesus in my life. And I want people at the end of my life to celebrate what Jesus has done in their life because of who he is, not because of who I am or am not. And what we're going to see this morning is we get to really a farewell speech of the Apostle Paul. 
As we've seen and journeyed through in Acts, especially the last couple of weeks, we know that he's been on all these missionary journeys. He's going from city to city, country to country, proclaiming Jesus, talking about Jesus. And, he, and we get to a point in Acts chapter 20 where he gives this farewell speech. He, is, he calls the, um, the leaders of Ephesus um, to him and says, hey, here's some final words. He spent three years approximately with that church, with the Ephesian leaders, pouring into them, establishing and building the church, teaching them, making disciples, doing all those things. And so uh, what we see is this, this idea of, hey, I'm gonna, I want to share these things with you because you're probably not going to see me again. And if you think about this in our life, good and <laughs> or bad, is that we are all leaving some type of legacy or impression on the people that we encounter. Every single day, the people that we come in contact with, whether it's in our immediate family, the people we work with, the people we see in the drive through we are making some type of impression on them. We're leaving some type of mark. And of course, obviously the people that are closest to us and know us, that we spend more time or we see more often, we are leaving some type of impression on them, good or bad. And Paul understands that. And as he's talking and and he's uh, communicating to these church leaders. He wants to leave a final impression. And, and at the forefront, it kind of looks like he's bragging about the life that he's, he's lived. But what he is pointing out are values that were a part of his life that he wants to impart on their life. To say, hey, this is how I've lived my life. I hope that you would do the same. And so um, let's pick up in Acts chapter 20. Um, we're going to start in verse 17, but before we do there, uh, or start reading that, um, I, I'll just share this, this because I think it's funny, and you might think I'm a horrible person, but before this, Paul's preaching in an upper room, and he preaches, he starts in the afternoon, it says they break bread, he begins to preach, and that he, <laughs> Luke says that he begins to preach, and he goes until midnight. It's like the world's longest preacher, right? So much so, we see this young man falls asleep, and he falls out of a window and dies, so, I mean, it, you think I preach long, okay? Um, I haven't seen anybody fall out of any windows and die, all right? I haven't preached that long. I'm not preaching until midnight because, quite frankly, I'm really hungry right now, all right? And so we're going to wrap this thing up, all right? So, um, so you and I can eat. But um, what we see is Paul communicates to the church uh, of Ephesus leaders, and he brings them in with these final words. So let's read this. And really, hopefully you can glean on some things this morning about how we should live our life. Um, so this is what he says, starting in verse 17. You can follow along on the screens. He says, Now with Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them this. He said, You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. Now let me kind of sum this up real quick. He's saying what I preached and what you saw, how I live, they were the same. They weren't in contradiction to one another. I wasn't being hypocritical. I went through a lot of hard times, imprisonment and trials, cried and had some tears. And what I preached and the way I walked were the same. I wasn't two-faced in that. You saw how I lived my life. And now verse 20, he says, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable. And teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance towards God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I'm going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. He's saying, hey, I know I'm going to Jerusalem and I'm going to go to Rome. And I know imprisonment and some hard times are right around the corner. But yeah, I'm still going to go. I know that some opposition is going to be there that I'm going to face. Yet it's worth it. I'm going. Verse 24. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus, to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. So therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all. 
For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. I shared everything. I didn't hide anything. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he attained with his blood, with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years, I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. He's like, this isn't a prosperity gospel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. And in all things, I've shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and he prayed with them all. And there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful most of all because of the word he had spoken that they would not see his face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. So incredible farewell speech to these leaders and what I want us to look into this, this morning is that what we see are some things that if you and I want to truly live a life that leaves a legacy, a legacy that's pointed to the gospel, that's pointed to Jesus, what are some things in our life that we can learn from Paul that need to be a part of our life? So if you're taking notes, the first thing is that we see that Paul, he had certainty and purpose. That if we want to make an impact for the gospel, we want to live a life that has eternal value that we see from Paul that he was certain about his purpose. He knew that God designed him, created him with the purpose to proclaim Jesus to anyone and everyone he encountered. It wasn't about himself. Now, you probably have heard this quote that if you aim at nothing, you will hit it every time. Have you ever heard that? And I think for many of us in our lives, we get in this vicious cycle of what our world communicates, of what our mission and what our purpose is, that we end up oftentimes with no direction, floundering in life, not knowing which way to turn. Here's how I see it kind of manifest in our life. I know that when I was in high school, what was drilled into me is you need to make good grades. Even earlier than that, you need to make good grades. Why? So you can go to a good college. And you need to go to a good college and, and, and make good grades there. And hopefully it'll be free because you made good grades in high school so that you can have a good job. And when you have a good job, then you, you are successful in life and you will be able to support your family. And now when you support your family, you'll get married, have an awesome spouse. You'll have 2.5 kids, live in a house with a white picket fence, right? And you'll be able to support them and they'll be able to make, you'll be able to make their wildest dreams come true. And as your kids grow up, you will teach them to what? In school, you need to make good grades. And why? So you can get into a good college, hopefully have some scholarship money. And when you get to a good college so you can have a good job, so you can support your wife, your husband, whatever the case may be, and then you will have kids and you will teach them the same thing. And it's a vicious cycle. Be and so my question would be, what happens when you make straight A's, you go to a good college and you get a degree that costs you hundreds of thousands of dollars and now you leave, you're in hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt and you don't use your degree, which happens very often. Now what's your purpose? What happens when you have that awesome job and you get laid off? Or it is not fun to do anymore. Or you can't support your family with the job that, of your dreams, or at least you thought so. See, for us, our meaning and our purpose are so much deeper than what the world tells us. And as believers... It, our, our purpose and meaning should be rooted in the gospel, in the work of Jesus, in the mission of proclaiming Jesus to anyone and everybody. This is what I know. I, while I want my kids to go to school and go to college and make good grades, I hope, I hope it's free. I don't want them to be in hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. You know, please hear me out. I'm not saying don't go to college. But if one of my kids doesn't go to college, 
but yet he knows Jesus and he's making Jesus famous across whatever he's doing in life. Amen to that. Who cares if he goes to college? And so it's all about this deep-rooted understanding that Paul has in this certainty of purpose. He understood, if you remember back in Acts 8, when he has this amazing encounter with, with uh, Paul has this amazing encounter with Jesus, he understands Hey, I was going this way. I was going to Damascus and I was going to arrest some Christians. I was going to kill them. And Jesus showed up and he literally opened his eyes. Why? Because he made them blind first. And then he had a, Paul had to trust some guys to walk him to Damascus holding his hand and to show him who he was as Savior. And now his perspective has changed and now his mission is no longer killing Christians. It's about telling people about Jesus so they can become Christians And now that's his mission in life. So he joins the disciples. He goes from city to city proclaiming this truth. And it wasn't just some mission for some project-based learning. It was was personal to him. And what we see is he is telling the church, uh, church leaders, he's like, this is everything to me. So much so, he says, I do not account my life of any value nor precious to me. You see, many of us, Our purpose and meaning, or at least what we think of as we go through life, is all about me. My life, my desires, my wants. We've been talking about that. I feel like it's all throughout Acts. And when it doesn't come or doesn't meet our expectations or our preferences, we're at a a, a critical crossroads. And Paul is saying, "My, my journey, my purpose is not about me. It's about Jesus. And he says what that meaning is. He says, it's not about me or any value nor as precious to myself. If only I may finish the course in the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus. What is the, the mission or the ministry? To testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Allah, he says this another way to the letter of Gal- in Galatians in Galatians 2.20. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. He says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. It's not about me and my wants. It's about Jesus. He's living in me. And the life I live now in the flesh, I live by faith. I live by trusting Jesus, who who, who, he was the son of God who gave himself for me. So the least that I can do is that as he gave himself for me, I don't need to give my life to him. That's his mission. He knows the value of the gospel, and he's proclaiming that with great certainty. And that's why he's saying, hey, I didn't hold anything back. I shared everything with you. Everything is out there. You know what I'm talking about. You know my purpose. You know why I've come. And and, and, and it's directed everything. And so here's where it applies to us. When the gospel is at the center of our lives, it directs everything about us. It directs everything about us. And here's what I mean by this. When our worldview and our lens, the lens of life is the gospel, it changes our perspective. So let me talk to the parents in the room. When the gospel is at the center, we look at parenting differently. Because parenting is not just raising good kids. It's not just, I hope that they make straight A's and they're the best athlete in the world and they get college scholarships to play a sport. The perspective under the gospel lens is, I hope they know Jesus and they make disciples. And so that changes how I parent. I parent because I'm the primary discipler as dad to my three boys. I want them to see Jesus as the most important thing of their life. Now, do I fail at that at times? Absolutely. But the thing is, is that I want them to see the most important thing in dad's life and in mom's life is Jesus. That we love Jesus more than your academic success, your athleticism, or anything else that's in my life or my priority. It's about Jesus. So you see how it changes. It changes how we interact with people, our family members, our coworkers, our neighbors. It changes everything. It develops this worldview that in us changes everything. And, and that comes with great confidence. When we know that purpose, it changes everything. So then we see that Paul then, not only was he, does he have certainty and purpose, but he has consistency and practice. So for us, we need consistency and practice. I think oftentimes, just being real and truthful, for many of us, we start the Christian life, if you're a Christian, you start the Christian life so well. 
I remember when I became a Christian my freshman year of high school, and like the first six months, it was like I was reading my Bible every day. It was just awesome. I was on fire for God. I was like, I'm going to, you know, kill Satan with a water pistol, <laughs> you know, type thing. And it's like, I'm going after it. And then life happens. And then it's like, I don't know when the last time I read my Bible. Or I made that quick little prayer. I'm not really walking with God. So I don't really know the purpose of it. These are to ask questions. Do I really need this? Or then you see people who claim to be Christ followers and they do stupid stuff. And you're like, that doesn't make any sense. I thought Jesus changed your life. Why are you acting like that? And to be quite honest, we can all kind of point the finger to ourselves in those kind of regards. But it, it's because we've, in some ways, I feel like many Christians are what I would call like one hit wonder Christians. You raise your hand, you it felt good for a second, and then you just kind of fell off the face of the planet. It's like you're a, a Christian vanilla ice, all right? Y'all get that later, all right? It's like you're just this one hit wonder. You felt good. It, it was great. You know you made the decision. You raised your hand. Everything was great, and then it just became all derailed. And I think that this happens to many of us, and we get derailed in a lot of different ways. But I think some main ways, or at least what I have seen and experienced, is this. I think oftentimes we go through college, which is a great, um, I don't know, crossroads of faith for many of us. But oftentimes what I see is you see somebody who's so on fire for Jesus, they fall in love with somebody who really is not. And they think, okay, I'm going to do this whole mission, what I call missionary dating. They'll, they'll come along. And so you get married. And then what happens is one spouse is like, we're going to go to church. We're going to read our Bible. And he's going to do it or she's going to do it. It's going to be great. And I always really do believe this. Maybe it's a pessimistic view. It's easier to bring someone down than it is to build them up. So what ends up happening is that, I sounded really country right there, happening, all right, is that you have a, two spouses. One's on fire for God. The other one's not. One's like, we need to go to church. The other one's like, no, nah, that's not for me. You can do that or I'll do it to appease you, but I, I, that's just not for me. I'd rather just watch sports. It's my only day off. I'm going to chill. So what ends up happening is you have the spouses on fire for God that either says, you know what? The battle's too, too great. You're never going to go. And so they become apathetic or they say, you know what? We're just not going to go. Then what creeps in is bitterness and resentment. And it's just not, it's not good. So now instead of having two people on fire for God, consistent in practice, now you have nobody. Or you see couples that are like, I was raised Baptist, he was raised Catholic, and we just don't go to church. And for us, we have to have consistency and practice. Another way relationally, oftentimes, that we become derailed is that we are not in biblical community. Meaning, we don't have anybody in our lives. We're not in a small group. We're not ha have people that are pouring into us in such a way, holding us accountable, encouraging us, challenging us. So it's easy to just come on church on Sunday, hear a message, and leave and live, live however you want and then not be a part of your everyday life and see you next Sunday. We need people in our lives. Following Jesus was never meant to be done alone. We need people that say, you know what, that's not okay. We need people that say, we need to start doing this. Or, hey, I'll pray for you. If you're going through a hard time of doubt, hey, we're in this together. We need people in that. I also think we, we become inconsistent in our faith because we're too busy with unimportant things instead of being busy with the most important thing. You know, this life happens. Man, there are some, some weeks where I'm like, man, I'm so ready for the weekend. I feel like I'm a professional Uber for my kids. You know, like they're doing this, 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 and this. And I'm like, before you know it, and if you're like me, I, I, I mean, I turned 41 in a couple weeks. And I feel, I feel like an old man some nights. Where like I get home and it's like the only time that I have, have with my wife. And, and I'm like snoring on the couch. You with me? All right. Like, I don't know if you're like, I'm like, I'm just so tired. I feel like all these things are just so busy. And we need to reprioritize our lives so they are consistent in practice. And Paul is saying this is so important. He's like, you didn't see me, like, you, I didn't cease night and day. I, I did these things. I'm traveling here. I'm doing this. And I'm not saying become a missionary. But what I am saying is that our priorities need to be straight. You want to live a life and have a legacy that points to the gospel? You better be walking with Jesus. Can't just be show up on Sunday and you're going to change the world through that. It takes great consistency in this. And he really points to really what I think, kind of studying this, three ways that we can be consistent in practice. If you look 
Let me read it again, verses 19 through 21. He says, I was serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me um, through the plots of the Jews and how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public from house to house. Think about this. One of the things that you and I can be um, consistent in practice is by serving. It says, he says, I serve the Lord with great humility. Man, we should put people above ourselves. You want to make a difference for the, the kingdom of Jesus? Serve people. Serve. I can tell you this, not growing up in church, but having an awesome student ministry, when I gave my life to Jesus, I was so involved in the church um, after that, but I couldn't tell you some cool series they did. I couldn't tell you the theme of camp. I couldn't tell you, you know, like this event and that event, what we had for lunch and the fun games we had, but I, this is what I can tell you. At the age of 14, my small group leader was a guy by the name of Barry Little. And Barry Little poured into this guy's life when I didn't have a man or a father figure in my life who was a Christian, a follower of Jesus that I could look up to. And Barry Little poured into my life and invited me into his life to see him as a husband and as a dad. He served as a small group leader in the student ministry. He changed my life. He changed my life. And whether you think this or not, whether you serve in preschool or kids or in students or you're greeting, you can have that same impact in someone else's life. When you put their needs above your own, we should be people who serve. The second thing that Paul says, he says that um, I was declaring to, uh, uh, I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable. So he didn't hide, but he was um, sharing and proclaiming Jesus. We want to make a mark in this life? Share Jesus. Share Jesus. Anyone and everyone that you come in contact with, let us talk about Jesus. He wasn't hiding from it. He wasn't like, oh, well, that's just culturally insensitive right now. He was talking about Jesus anywhere and everywhere, declaring. And then he says um, in the last part, and teaching you in public and from house to house. He was teaching. He was making disciples. He was grabbing people like, we see this in Paul's life, Barnabas, Timothy, Silas. He's bringing them by his side and saying, let's do life together. Let me show you how to live for Jesus. He says, intimidate, uh, intimidate, imitate me as I imitate Jesus, uh, Jesus. And so he's saying, hey, let's do this together. You and I, the great commission, Jesus said, his final words were go and make disciples. And I know that's intimidating. You might be like, well, I'm not mature in my faith. I don't, I don't know any Bible verses in that. Jesus didn't say, memorize the entire Bible. He didn't say, do a 365 plan. He didn't say, go through this class, be a Christian for X amount of years. He said, go and make. You and I should be grabbing people and making disciples. Now, let me just give you a tip. Don't go to somebody that needs, like you wanna help mature in their faith and be like, will you be my disciple? All right, don't do that. Because then they might ask you what Kool-Aid they have to drink or what Netflix special they might be on or <laughs> Dateline or any of the other crazy stuff that's come out in the last year. But someone that you love and care for, invest into their life. Point them to Jesus. That's what Paul did. And that takes, that consistency takes great evaluation and intentionality. Think about this. Anything that we want and desire and to grow and be consistent in, we have to evaluate. We have to come to a place that you and I look at our lives in a humble way and say, am I following Jesus with the best, the best way I can? And you know it. I, you, you're, it's easy to say, I haven't read my Bible in forever. I haven't prayed. I'm not leading my, my marriage. I'm not discipling my kids. But you got to get to that place and stop saying, oh, it's, I'm not as bad as that guy or that girl. To look at it and then to be intentional and take steps to say, what can I do? And how am I going to make it happen with our life? And the third point in closing that Paul says, you want to leave a, a life of legacy. Not only do you need to be certain about purpose and consistent in practice, but you got to have to have concern for people. You got to love people well. You got to see people like Jesus sees them. Paul says, he says um, to the leaders, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. In verse 35, he says, in all these things, I've shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help 
the weak, and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said it, was, uh, it is more blessed to give than to receive. You know, when our kids, uh, my boys were young, well, I didn't teach them this, but when they were little, some of their first words were mine. Do you have kids that do that? I know y'all have great kids. They're better than mine, but um, uh, just kidding. <laughs> Is that when they're young, they say mine. They're like seagulls from Nemo. Have you ever seen that movie? Mine, 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 right? We're selfish in nature. And I feel like probably in the last 10 years, this is just, that's just a guess. I feel like individually, we probably become more selfish. It's about my needs, my wants, my preferences, my desires, all this other stuff. You don't like it, you know, shame on you. You're in the wrong. You didn't vote the way I did, you're in the wrong. You don't like what I like, you're in the wrong. You don't want to talk that way, you're in the wrong. All these different things, we're point, point, point. Have you noticed, like we live in a world that you can no longer agree to disagree, right? And so it's one of those things that, that we just kind of put ourselves on a pedestal and Paul's like, it's not about me. It's about others. And I think one of the biggest problems of the church today is that it's good at saying we love God, but it's horrible at the application of loving others. That if God is love, we are called to love one another. And that they know, and I'm not, I'm not talking about some frou-frou, like let's just love everybody. All right? I'm not saying don't stand for truth and what's biblical and, and compromise the gospel. I'm not talking about that. But oftentimes when, I, when I'm talking about our concern for people, I'm not talking about a concern of, oh, I can't believe they believe that. They're going to hell. I'm saying a great concern for their eternity in the sense that says they need Jesus. And God's placed me in their life to tell them about Jesus. Do I honestly care for them? Do I care more about their eternity than their political stance or how they get on my nerves or how I disagree or what, how they live their life, or whatever the case may be? Do I love them so much because I see the value of eternity over all the other things that our life says or our, our world says? So here, here's the question I wanna put in front of you that when you die one day and they're at, people are at your funeral, what will they say about you? What will they say about the way that you lived your life? Would they say that you had an incredible purpose that was rooted in the gospel? Would they say that you were consistent, that you didn't just talk about it, but you actually did it? Not perfection, but consistently. And would they say that you care for people? Here's where it starts. It starts with just giving it to Jesus. Because each of us have things in our life that we're like, I think I'm there, but I like to kind of have this control. You know exactly where you are right now. So does God. The Holy Spirit's been working in you, pointing out things, convicting your heart. It says, there, here's an area I'm holding on to. Give it to Jesus this morning. Give it to him this morning. Let's pray together. Father, we're so thankful for who you are. Thankful for Paul's words that show us that his life was centered on you. Let that be a challenge to us this morning. For you to be the center of all things directing every aspect of our life. And out of that, let us be consistent in growing and becoming more and more intimate with you, God. So that not only do we love you with everything that we have, but we can love people well. Let us not be fake Christians that say one thing and do another, but let us follow you with everything. And that starts with surrender. So God, take it all this morning. And I pray that as we sing this closing song, that it would be our prayer of our hearts just to give it to you, that you are our everything. It's in your son's name we pray, amen. Let's stand and give it to Jesus this morning.